good morning friends i am sachin ketkar i teach english at the ms university of baroda and i have with me my friend pankti desai and she is from the spb college of business administration udna and uh, we have a very interesting and exciting topic on our hands we are going to talk about one of the most influential and powerful tradition of poetry in the world and that is american poetry and uh, if there is one thing that uh, americans should really be proud of apart from their opulence or military power or hollywood is their poetry so what we are going to do pankti and me we are we have brought a slide show we are going to look at the tradition of american poetry with special reference to uh, whitman robert frost and emily dickinson but our emphasis will be totally on the tradition of american poetry some peculiarities the main features of uh, american poetry so what we are going to do we are going we are going to start with our discussion on uh, the tradition of american poetry so before we start let us look at what the term american means so let us look at the slides that we have brought all of us know that the word america is another name for the united states of america also known as the us or the us of a so uh, it stands for that geographical location on the north hemisphere called america then who are americans americans are the indigenous people of america or the native americans who are believed to have migrated from asia between 12000 and 40000 years ago and it was only in 1492 that the explorer named christopher columbus under the contract of spanish crown made the first contact with this indigenous people and he is the person who has coined the phrase uh, red indians because he was looking for a new route to asia and india so the earliest american poetry would be before uh, the european contact that is before 1492 and the poetry before founding of the united states was largely oral it was oral tradition and after the founding of uh, the 13 colonies british colonies in the united states uh, most of the colonial poetry that is the poetry of europeans who had come down to america was basically la based largely on british poetry of the 17th century yes. and the influence of puritanism is clearly felt in american poetry the reason being the people who went to america from britain were many of them were uh, puritans and all, as all the students of english literature know puritans were a sect of uh, christians who believed that uh, reformation was further needed in english church and one of the most famous puritan writer as we all know is john milton one of the earliest poets of british colony was ann bradstreet and she was also one of the earliest women poets who wrote in english so if you look at the period 1612 to 1672 then this is the 17th century and the earliest american one of the most important earliest american poets was ann bradstreet the post independence american poetry the 13 american colonies founded by the people who went from britain to america and who had settled on the western side of american subcontinent they declared themselves as independent of british empire on 4th july 1776 and this day as we all know is the independence day of america along with independence came need to be independent as far as literature also went so the need to be free from the british poetic models and traditions is one of the important concerns of post independence american poets some of the most important poets of the 19th century that is the post independence period were the poets like ralph waldo emerson henry wadsworth longfellow and edgar allan poe one of the most uh, most important feature as we said we are going to look at the tradition of american poetry and one of the most important and significant features of american poetry is the search for distinctive american voice the voice that is essentially authentically american and that can emerge only if 
people find their true identity. And this search for distinctive American voice and identity is reflected in the presence of American landscape and native traditions in their poetry. So most of the poets who wrote in this period wrote about their own landscape, the prairies, the New England, and the other areas of United States for, featured prominently in their poetry. One of the very important movements, cultural movements in America after independence, after 1776, is the movement called American Transcendentalism. Transcendentalism is one of very important movements in America and it started as a protest against general state of culture and society in America. It was founded on the belief that the ideal spiritual state transcends or goes beyond the physical and the empirical and hence can be realized only through the individual's intuition rather than through doctrines of established religions. So American transcendentalism was a kind of a uh, critical movement which sought to establish a different kind of religion which is uh, not the same as the established church or established dogma. So what we see here is a desire to uh, break away from social conventions and established uh, religious practices that we find in transcendentalism. One of the very interesting aspects of transcendentalism is the influence of Indian spiritual traditions especially as it went to Germany and from Germany it went to Britain and from Britain it went to America. So this is one of the prominent uh, characteristics of uh, American transcendentalism, especially if you look at poetry of Longfellow, then you find poems written on subjects like Brahma and he has written poems on Gita and so on. The prominent transcendentalists included people like Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, Thoreau, as we all know, is one of the influential thinkers who has influenced Mahatma Gandhi. Thoreau's very important book on civil disobedience was adapted by Gandhiji for his own political purpose. And Walt Whitman, 1819 to 1892, whom we are going to look at a little bit more closely. What is interesting here is also that some of the novelists like Melville, who wrote very famous novel like Moby Dick were also greatly influenced by transcendentalism. Transcendentalism was a distinctive, as we see in the slide, was a distinctly American strain of English Romanticism uh, uh, as represented by William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Emerson, an American scholar, a very influential philosopher, went to Britain and is believed to have met Wordsworth and Coleridge and that is how influence from Germany went to Britain and from Britain it went to America. With transcendentalism we find a kind of manifesto that uh, of manifesto for the search of true American voice. Emergence of true American voice uh, coincided with Emerson's very important uh, essay called American Scholar in 1837 where he says, our day of dependence, our long apprenticeship to the learning of other land draws to close. It, it, it is seen as something as American declaration of independence at intellectual level. So scholarship declared themselves to be free of British uh, tutelage. Two very different poets represent the emergence of this new spirit of freedom and genuine American voice and these are the two poets that we are going to look at a bit closely and those two poets are Walt Whitman and Emily Dickinson. These two poets as we know are extremely different and the difference between these two is the difference between two American poetic idioms, the way, the styles and way of expression which are characteristic of American poetry. A very important uh, uh, literary critic named Louis Untermeyer in his book called Modern American Poetry notes that these two poets represent two major American poetic idioms. The free metric, that is the free words and direct emotional expression of Walt Whitman and gnomic obscurity and irony of Dickinson. The word gnomic is very interesting. Gnomic implies uh, a kind of mysterious and supernatural obscurity. 
Gnomes, as we know, are supernatural beings like elves. Both of these kind of idioms would stamp the American poetry of 20th century. These are two almost models which uh, people followed. Now I'm going to talk to Pankti and tell her to talk, tell us a bit more about Walt Whitman, who is the probably one of the most important American poets of 19th century. So let's look at Walt Whitman, Pankti. He's America. Whitman is often called America's first poet of democracy. Modernist poet Ezra Pound said he's America. Walt Whitman was born into a working class family in West Hills, New York, a village near Hempstead, Long Island, on May 31, 1819, just 30 years after George Washington was inaugurated as the first president of the newly formed United States. Walt Whitman's Life Whitman worked as a journalist, a teacher, a government clerk, and a volunteer nurse during the American Civil War in addition to publishing his poetry. Pankti, American Civil War is something that we should uh, just uh, as a step aside and look at the historical context of American Civil War because it's one of the most influential event in the history of the United States of America. Hmm. Uh, Civil War started between the two uh, regions of America no, known as Northern America and Southern, Southern America. The Northern Americans were largely industrial industrial kind of area and the southern was largely agrarian and uh, agriculture and there was a lot of slavery prevalent in the southern area of uh, uh, America and so the civil war was fought the, over an issue which was which is which was to actually determine the fate of American literature in 20th century and that uh, issue was race slavery the blacks the African American people brought from Africa and they their freedom was one of the central issues and as we know Abraham Lincoln was one of, one of the most important persons who, to, uh, who decided the fate of uh, American democracy and uh, that's why Whitman also celebrates Abraham Lincoln and he himself served in, uh, served in uh, American Civil War. Hmm. Yes, uh, after a stroke towards the end of his life he moved to Camden, New Jersey, where his health further declined. He died at age 70, at the age of 72, and his funeral became a public spectacle. Whitman's, uh, an American epic, he's known as Whitman's, uh, his, uh, he has written, Whitman's major work, Leaves of Grass, was first published in 1855 with his own money. The work was an attempt at reaching out to the common person with an American epic. He continued expanding and revising it until his death in 1892. Leaves of Grass. So, Pankti, interestingly, he continued to uh, edit and add to single collection that he brought out, that was Leaves yeah. of Grass, for 40 to 50 years of his yeah. life. That's very interesting. Yeah, till the end of his life. life. Yeah. Leaves of Grass, Walt Whitman, at the age of 37, front, frontispice to Leaves of Grass, still engraving by Samuel Hollier. Leaves of Grass. Leaves of Grass has its genesis in an essay called The Poet by Emerson, which expressed the need for the United States to have its own new and unique poet to write about the new country's virtues and vices. The title of the title Leaves of Grass was a pun. Grass was a term given by publishers to work of minor value, and leaves is another name for the pages on which they were printed. Pankte, interestingly, the pun on the title itself is very interesting. Yes. Leaves of grass. Grass signifies not just uh, an element of landscape in poetry. There is a pun on grass. Grass means a minor work. Mm -hmm. But actually what Whitman was doing is that he is writing the first American epic. Yes. And that's how he is, seems to have founded the entire tradition of uh, American poetry single-handedly with this leaves of grass. Yes, I agree with you. Uh, once Self I Sing, one of the most important poems in Leaves of Grass. 
वन सेल्फ आई सिंग वन सेल्फ आई सिंग अ सिंपल सेपरेट पर्सोना येट अनदर इन वर्ल्ड येट अटर द वर्ड डेमोक्रेटिक द वर्ड इन मास ऑफ लाइफ इमेंस इन पैसन पल्स एंड पावर चेयरफुल फॉर फ्रीएस्ट एक्शन फॉर्म्ड अंडर द लॉज डिवाइन द मॉडर्न मैन आई सिंग Terry Mulcair on one's self icing a poetic universe of productive tension is hinted by that yet the tense equipoise between individualism and democracy this poem suggest is the foundational theme of Whitman's book the poem then goes on to introduce the site and symbol for this re- uh, reconciliation of individual to mass the body i think the body electric this radical power of human body is celebrated in the poem i think the body electric i think the body electric i think the body electric the armies of those i love engirth me and i engirth them they will not let me off till i go with them respond to them and discourup them and charge them full with the charge of the soul anti what uh, the word discorrupt is very interesting in the poet uh, we have all heard of the term corrupt and what would actually discorrupt our soul would be our body so this is a very new way of looking at body whitman seems to be doing two things here one he seems to find that body is what connects a separate individual to entire mass of humanity so he seems to be reconciling the individualistic spirit of uh, america with the democratic spirit we seems to be there seems to be some tension between the two democracy versus individualism and what mulcair is saying that he is, he strikes the balance between individualism and democratic spirit and he does it by focusing on human body and that is why human body becomes an, a site of celebration for whitman and uh, he was very bold in celebration of human body his own body and that's why he ran into trouble with censorship and many of uh, char- many of people were very angry with whitman for writing what they thought was very obscene and very explicit sexual things so leaves of grass also had to enter into this obscenity trial but what whitman is doing is he's celebrating human body as something which reconciles individualism versus democratic spirit and that is why he sings i sing the body electric very that's true. very interesting yeah the self and the i whitman seems to put himself in the center but the self of the poem speaker the i of the poem should not be limited to or confused with the person of the historical walt whitman this is an expansive persona one that has exploded the conventional boundaries of the self as he say i am large i contain multitudes some other poems of uh, whitman are out of the cradle endlessly rocking i hear america singing a noiseless passion spider his poems like when lila clasped in the dooryard bloom and o oh, captain my captain are elegies on the death of abraham lincoln so what we see here in life and works of walt whitman is the founding theme of american poetic tradition how to reconcile democratic instinct or democratic spirit with individualism at the same time how to reconcile with seemingly opposite uh, uh, forces we also see that uh, what whitman is doing is he is breaking himself free from fetters of british poetic traditions as represented by meters and rhymes of uh, of british poetry the iambics and trochees what he is doing he, he is using free words so use of free words stands for declaration of freedom as far as poetic expression was concerned so uh, you can say that what uh, emerson did in american scholar was he declared uh, scholarship to be free from colonial heritage what whitman is doing that he is declaring his own freedom as an american poet in 
leaves of grass and that's why Walt Whitman is one of the most important poets of American poetic tradition. Now what we are going to do is we are going to look at somebody who is extremely different, almost contrasting to Walt Whitman. While Walt Whitman lived a life which was bohemian, which was rebellious, which was very, very extroverted, very, very public. What we find here is another person named Emily Dickinson. Let's look at her life. Emily Dickinson is one of the most important American poets and contemporaries of Walt Whitman. They belong to the same period. She was born 10th December 1930 in Amherst, Massachusetts, where she lived until her death on 15th May 1886. Although she was a very prolific poet, she wrote thousands, almost hundreds and thousands of poems. Only few does, fewer than a dozen of her 1800 poems were published in, during her lifetime. She stayed away from public fame and gaze, unlike uh, Walt Whitman, who seems to be very public, very open in his expression. Uh, Emily Dickinson is reserved, she is reclusive. And what we can do is very interestingly con uh, contrast the poem like, I sing myself, oneself I sing with this poem that we have in front of us. And this poem is, I am nobody, who are you? Dickinson writes, I am nobody, who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us. Don't tell, they would advertise, you know. How dreary to be somebody. How public, like a frog. To tell one's name, the livelong June, to an admiring bog. So, what, uh, while Whitman is celebrating his self, one self I sing, Dickinson is saying that I am nobody. And that is why, and it's such a great thing to be nobody. Unlike uh, the American desire to be somebody. Right? So, Dickinson seems to be asserting her own individuality by saying that I don't want to live li like mo how most of the people live. Let's look at her life, Emily Dickinson. Dickinson was a private and introverted person who disliked fame. As the poem I Am Nobody shows, Adriani Rich notes that this privacy, this seclusion, this reclusiveness was actually freedom to her. Her decision not to be very public, not to be, live a very public life, is the decision which gave her freedom to be who she was. Dickinson's life as well as her poetry stands in complete contrast to Whitman, as we will see. Let's look at her style. Emily Dickinson's style is something very unique and we can very profitably compare it with Walt Whitman's style. While Walt Whitman wrote long sentences in free verse and almost you can say that uh, there is an influence of Christian Bible, King James Bible on Whitman's style. Dickinson's poems are uh, poems with very short lines. They lack titles. They have slant rhymes, means words that do not rhyme completely, only their consonants rhyme, not their vowels. And unconventional capitalization that you will find. All of a sudden you will find a word being capitalized. And a very strange use of punctuation. So what uh, Dickinson seems to be doing is that she is almost uh, rejecting British tradition in her own way. So on one hand you have uh, Walt Whitman who re rejects British traditions by writing free words. Here you have Emily Dickinson who rejects free words and she rejects also the British tradition by writing very short, very standard kind of format and very strange way of writing that she has uh, evolved. Look, let us look at what she wrote about her major themes. Many of her poems deal with the themes of death and immortality, two recurring topics in her letter to her friends. And we again see influence of American transcendentalism uh, on uh, her philosophy and her outlook to life. So these are two very important themes, but these are not, of course, the only themes. Let's look at a, her very famous poem here. Because I could not stop for death, because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. The very famous and noted critic Alan Tate says about this very typical Dickinson poem is, if the word great means anything in poetry, the poem is one of the greatest in English language. 
The tradition of American poetry can be represented by contrasting figures of Whitman and Dickinson. What seems to unite them both is the distinctive and very individualistic voice that is at once very American and very powerful. Tradition of American poetry. Let's look at this slide. The tradition of American poetry, the passionate quest for genuine American identity and the spirit of non-conformity continued in the 20th century. The rise of modernism. Modernism emerged in the early part of the 20th century as a race reaction against the sentimental and romantic Victorian period. Uh, let us look at the rise of modernism. Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot steered American poetry towards, uh, towards greater density, difficulty and opacity with the use of techniques like fragmentation, ellipsis, illusion, juxtaposition, ironic and sifting persona and mythic parallelism. Pankti, if you look at the term modernism, then it's not very surprising that it, it's an American invention almost. It's an almost a term that is invented by Americans. It started in America and it's not very surprising that it started in America because look at Whitman, look, look at Dickinson. They are the people who seem to be rejecting tradition in search of their own self and their own authentic voice. They seem to be rejecting tradition and what else is modernism but re rejecting conventional ways of writing and thinking in favor of authentic and what you are, something which is close to who you are. So in some ways, Whitman and Dickinson also are modernist in that sense. Yes. Uh, two early modernists, Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot. Imagism. Modernist poetry in English is generally considered to have emerged with the appearance of the Imagist movement. Imagism favored precision of imagery and clear, sharp language and rejected the sentiment and discursiveness, typical of much romantic and Victorian poetry. They emphasized the use of free verse. Other modernist poets. Other modernist poets of the period include Gertrude Strain, Wallace Stevens, William Carlos Williams, Hilda Dolittle, Marion Moore, E. E. Cummings, and Hart Crane. Let us look at Robert Frost, yeah. the uh, major American uh, modernist poet. Right. Uh, very interestingly, the relationship of Robert Frost with modernism was a very different kind of modernism that he seemed to have invented for himself. Robert Frost did not actually belong to the school of Ezra Pound or T.S. Eliot or even Wallace Stevens kind of poetry, which was very dense, very opaque, very fragmented, almost incomprehensible kind of poetry that these people wrote. Robert Frost wrote poetry which people could understand. But in spite of this, what he seems to be doing is that he is bringing in some, a very distinctive American flavor, American ethos and American locale into his poetry. At the same time, he is bringing in a very modern kind of sensibility. This is the picture of Robert Frost, 1874 to 1963. He is one of the most influential American poets of 20th century. Let's look at uh, some of the details about his life and, I, and these details are also very interesting. Robert Frost was born in San Francisco on March 26, 1874. He moved to New England at the age of 11 and became interested in reading and writing poetry during his high school years in Lawrence, Massachusetts. New England is the area where uh, the earliest British colonies settled uh, in 15th century and uh, so these were the 13 colonies, American colonies, which declared themselves free from British co colonial power. So there is something very British and English about and that's why it's called New England. And a person from New England is often called Yankee. So Robert Frost wrote about Yankee life and uh, Yankee uh, culture. He was enrolled in Dartmouth College. Let's look at this slide. In 1892 and later at Harvard, though he never earned a formal degree, he never earned a formal BA or MA. Uh, 
poetry of Robert Frost. Let's look at his works. Robert Frost is highly regarded for his realistic depictions of rural life and his, and his command of American colloquial speech. Though his poems avoid the experimental excesses and techniques of modernist contemporaries like Ezra Pound or like uh, William Carlos Williams or like E. E. Cumming, his poetry is also very modern and very American sensibilities can be detected in a Frost poetry. Besides that, the influence of imagism, as, as we have seen earlier, the imagism is also seen clearly on his works. And it's no surprise that the group of poets around who, who were clubbed as imagists and when they were running a magazine called Poetry, one of the oldest little magazines and one which still probably survives, uh, f uh, this Poetry magazine first published poems of uh, Robert Frost. His work frequently employed settings from rural life in New England in the early 20th century, using them to examine complex social philosophical themes. Though poems which look very simple or uh, they deal with very ordinary mundane day-to-day -day life, the poems have some philosophical significance which lies behind, beyond the lines of his poem. A popular and often quote, quoted poet, Frost was honored frequently during his lifetime, receiving four Pulitzer Prizes for poetry, and that's very surprising for a person who had no formal degree of B.A. or M.A. Mending Wall, a typical Frost poem is Mending Wall. Probably many of the students might be familiar with this poem, Mending Wall, which appeared in north of Boston in 1914. It is a meditative lyric that reports and assesses a dialogue between neighbors who have joined in an annual occupation of rebuilding the wall which separates them. There is this annual ritual almost where because of heavy snow, the walls which separate the fences, which separate the farms actually have broken down. So it's an annual ritual where both the farmers get together and put uh, replace the wall. Now this activity is uh, made into a very symbolic activity in Frost poems. And these are the very famous lines. Good fences make good neighbor. The poem Mending Wall re-examines the stock belief regarding the relationship between human beings and the relationship of human beings with nature. The speaker in the poem, a, North, a New England farmer, a typical Yankee farmer, questions the conventional wisdom of mankind. Good fences make good neighbors. And he seems to ironically indicate that the forces of nature do not ex ex accept human boundaries. Though good fences may make, make good neighbors, nature does not recognize any neighbors and human boundaries. Let's look at a very another, another very famous poem by Frost. It's titled Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. Probably students must again might be familiar with this very famous poem, which appeared in Robert Frost's 1922 collection, New Hampshire, and it's widely known. And uh, uh, very interestingly, look at the title of this collection, New Hampshire, again uh, indicating the region and the locale where it came from. So regionality, this a uh, sense of belonging to a particular region is very important aspect of Frost's poetry. Classic. The last stanza of the poem is extremely famous. Let's look at these very famous lines. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. These lines are, uh, are so famous that Jawaharlal Nehru is believed to have kept the, these lines on his table. That's why they are so famous, even in India today. A very well-known critic, Jeffrey Myers, has his own take on this, on this poem. Though the poem is read simplistically as a conflict between duty and beauty, or between romantic worldview and a practical pragmatic view, Jeffrey Myers says that the theme of stopping by woods is temptation of death, even suicide, symbolized by the woods that are filling up with snow on the darkest evening of the year. The speaker says, the woods are lovely, dark and deep, but he resists their morbid attraction, as if the poet is thus selecting life over death, in spite of the fact that death is so attractive and beautiful. Death is something which is a, much of a temptation for the speaker. In spite of that, 
the speaker make us a choice that I have to go miles before I really actually sleep. Let's look at another very famous poem by Frost. And the poem is The Road Not Taken. One of the most famous American poems is The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. It was published in the collection Mountain Intervals in 1916. The speaker in the poem is a traveler who is remembering his journey. He says that he had to make a choice between two roads at an important juncture in his life. The speaker, the traveler says, at the end of the poem he says, I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages, ages hence. Two roads diverge in the wood, that I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. The traveler's choice in living unconventional life indicates his philosophical outlook his individualism and non-conformist attitude. And in some way for me, Panti, this uh, attitude of selecting the road which is less traveled by is characteristic of modern American poetic tradition. It almost, uh, it almost symbolizes American poetry. The journey of American poetry can be summed Sometimes. up as follows. The attitude of American poets are like those of the speaker individualist, non-conformist and always keen to venture into unknown territories. The American tradition of the new, the major American poets like Walt Whitman, Emily Dickinson and Robert Frost have always believed in taking the road which is usually not taken and which wanted where. The American tradition of the new Consequently, they have made all the difference to literary tradition by opening new pathway and streets and hence have been immensely influential internationally. Pankti, very interestingly is yes, uh, the whole, uh, the whole uh, idea of... Uh, Ubaru. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very interestingly here is the idea of not taking the road which mm. is uh, well worn, which is taken by many others. So American poetry, if you want to characterize it, then it is the poetry which searches for new areas, right? It searches for the areas which people have not explored. Yes. It ventures into, uh, er, it's very courageous kind of poetry, which says that we do not want to follow traditions and conventions. What we want to do is to walk on our own path, True. the path that we want to live. And that is what makes American poetry so influential all over the world. In fact, the poets that we have mentioned in our discussion, apart from Frost, Whitman, and Dickinson, the poets mm -hmm. like uh, William Carlos Williams, E. E. Cummings, T. S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, Wallace Stevens, are such important influences on uh, all the major languages in the world. Consider Gujarati, consider Marathi, all these uh, Indian languages uh, modernist poetry of this, uh, these languages also bear influence of these poets and mm -hmm. American tradition. So American tradition is an international tradition in the sense that uh, it has impacted the poetry all over the world. Yeah, why don't you focus uh, something on postmodern poets after Frost? Or right. Uh, postmodernism in America actually began a, with rejection of uh, very difficult kind of poetry which and very objective, very impersonal, very classical kind of poetry which T.S. Eliot wrote. So there was in some way a rejection of uh, modernism in postmodern American poetry and it began with what is known as uh, confessional poetry. And confessional poetry says that poetry should not be impersonal, but it mm. must be about your life. It's almost like autobiography. And so what poets seem to be writing in confessional poetry is their own life. Right. And they wrote it very courageously. And uh, very famous names are Robert Lovell, yes. uh, Theodore Redke, yeah. Sylvia Elizabeth Plath, Bishop, right. and Adrienne Rich. Etude. Right. So these poets wrote poetry which was very much personal. Yes. There was also a reaction in the, what is known as uh, the beat poetry or uh, the hippie poetry. Yeah. As represented by William Carl. Uh, no, no, it's represented by uh -huh. Gins Alan Ginsberg yes. and Jack Kerouac. And Ginsberg wrote a very famous poem called Howl. Yes. 
or supermarket yes. in America. And Ginsburg seems to be using none other than Walt Whitman as his model. So Walt Whitman is still alive in American poetry. So is uh, Emily Dickinson and so is Robert Frost. So Pankti, actually we should thank our listeners for yes. uh, listening to us so attentively. And uh, Same time I, Isaac Sandan. Yeah. I would also like to thank Isaac Sandan, Sandan for giving me opportunity to talk. And both of us wish all our listeners very happy Diwali and New Year in advance. Thank you. Thank you.